Ah, raccoons. Cute, cuddly trash pandas admired the world over. Which begs the question, why, if they are so beloved, did somebody ship a live raccoon across the country hoping the President of the United States would eat it instead of a Thanksgiving turkey? At first you might be wondering if America's political elite considered raccoon to be a delicacy at some point in the past. But unfortunately the answer to that question is no. Raccoon was not eaten among high society at any point in the 1900s. And it's very unlikely that raccoons were considered fancy food in American culture during the 18th or 19th century as well. That's why President Calvin Coolidge felt uncomfortable eating Rebecca the Raccoon for Thanksgiving dinner in 1926. He was playfully ridiculed by at least one newspaper for having cosmopolitan tastes and pardoning the Thanksgiving mammal. The raccoon was originally sent to the White House by Vinnie Joyce from Nittayuma, Mississippi, a still unincorporated community along the Mississippi River. Rebecca Raccoon was then adopted by second lady Grace Coolidge and kept lovingly for several years. She was a wild animal, the raccoon, not the first lady, supposedly bit the president multiple times and hated large meetings, such as the Easter egg roll in 1927. There's Rebecca at the bottom, getting ready to savagely attack a small child. After the Coolidge's left in 1929, Rebecca was sent to the Rock Creek Zoo in DC, where she died shortly after. When Herbert Hoover took office in early 1929, Billy Possum claimed squatter's rights on Rebecca's prior home. He was shortly apprehended by Officer B. B. Snodgrass before being granted permission to live in Rebecca's prior home for the rest of his life with few changes, namely becoming the mascot of a Little League team. However, it is worth noting that Rebecca Raccoon was sent to the White House with the intention of accompanying the Thanksgiving turkey or even replacing it. Raccoons were eaten extensively during the 1800s to the point that Mark Twain wrote about possum and raccoon being two of the main American meals he missed on his tour of Europe. They were, and still are, classified small game within hunting laws and are sometimes given special considerations as to handling and hunting. There were mentions of them being cooked in traditional African style by many black communities, and raccoons were wildly eaten throughout Native American societies prior to European settlement, by being hunted rather than being farmed. Further, there are only a few examples of raccoons being farmed, namely in the 1920s. However, this was mainly for fur, specifically for raccoon fur coats, a 1920s fad among college students, rather than for meat and there have been no industrial attempts to farm raccoons in the United States since then. Quite simply, the history of raccoons as a food source is the history of hunting in the U.S., and specifically of small game hunting within the United States. It is important to pause here and give a quick note of what made people lose a taste for small game, and specifically raccoon. There were three main factors. First was the mass urbanization of the American population. Second was the Green Revolution, a period after the 1950s of massive agricultural overhaul. And as a result of these two factors were a subsequent change in the hunting patterns of Americans. Let's begin in 1920, as that is when Rebecca Raccoon was sent to the White House. The 1920 census places approximately one half of individuals in rural areas. There were also relatively few laws governing conservation of natural resources, with the National Park Service only being founded in 1916. Before that, there was an understanding that America was a land of bountiful wealth, and that included its natural resources, including animals. Raccoons were often specifically targeted to the point that a hunting tradition developed known as cooning, and dog breeds, known as coonhounds, were bred specifically to hunt raccoons and other small games such as possums. During this point in time, many Americans engaged in subsistence hunting, a system by where which a family would hunt wild animals as a food source. Subsistence hunting was just one of the options within the system to feed the family and came secondary to farming, gathering, gardening, or purchasing the primary bulk of the family's meals. Within subsistence hunting, anything that walks, crawls, swims, flies, hops, or slithers is considered fair game and can be killed, captured, or trapped because it goes well in a stew or a gumbo. This brought raccoon to the family table. It was one of many creatures that a rural family could hunt, prepare, cook, and eat in the same day and existed virtually across all of North America. Furthermore, 
Raccoons were legally considered varmints in many areas, and local laws encouraged wide-scale extinction of the raccoon for its effect on crops and livestock, similar to organized attempts to eradicate the gray wolf. Over the decades, as the population urbanized, there was less regular access to wild game. Many of the traditional avenues to hunt were cut off, and it was more difficult to access hunting areas on a daily basis within urban centers. There also existed a different cultural consciousness in where food comes from. Most urbanites did not, and still do not, produce the majority of their own food. While urban gardening has seen massive surges over the years, such as during World War II with Victory Gardens, these are often short-lived, and they're intended to supplement purchased, often heavily processed food, rather than take over as the primary method of food production. There have subsequently been less hunters in urban areas per capita than in rural areas, where ready access and a cultural consciousness of self-reliance are much more present. Further, with the advent of the Green Revolution, the concept of food consumption changed radically. The Green Revolution was the period between the 1950s and 1970s, where agricultural production boomed worldwide, causing a subsequent population boom. The revolution involved a wide-scale introduction of agricultural machinery such as tractors, harvesters, and advanced irrigation systems. This enabled a very small number of farmers to perform massive amounts of labor that would have previously taken dozens or even hundreds of people to complete in the same amount of time. For reference, in 1870, about 50% of people worked in agriculture. By 1980, that number dropped to just 4%, and it currently sits at less than 1%. The mechanical labor was also coupled with a dedicated effort to standardize crops and farm animals. Farms became highly specialized as a result. Growing a single crop, or even sometimes a single variety of crop, or raising only a single breed of animal. This accessibility of an industrial scale of production led to cheaper meat prices and consistent meat quality. The average person bought their meat from a store at this point, and those stores bought large quantities of meat from farms that were engaged in the mass production of relatively few kinds of animals, limiting options for consumers. Government subsidies were highly involved in this change from hunting to farmed animals as well, driving crop prices to a never seen before low, but also incentivizing farmers to utilize as much of their land as possible. The extensive farming removed fallow areas in which small game often lived making it even harder to hunt small game in these rural areas. However, interestingly enough, this initial loss in accessibility of hunting areas did not cause a decline in hunting license issued, or even a decline in small game hunting. In the 1970s and 1980s, more hunting licenses were issued than at any other point over the past 100 years. Further, hunting small game was still popular enough that magazines would feature small game on the cover. However, what is important to note is that hunting patterns did change over the years. As I mentioned previously, most raccoons and assorted small game came to the kitchen table through subsistence hunting. After the Green Revolution, very few people needed to supplement their diet through this way. This shifted the nature of hunting from something that was done out of a necessity to something that was done for leisure. Small game hunters began to focus on a specific quarry to hunt, typically squirrels, rabbits, or fowl. However, Beginning in the 80s and leading into the 90s, big game began to replace small game as the most popular form of hunting. This is still the case today. In 2016, there were 9.2 million big game hunters and only 3.5 million small game hunters. This is both because of the aforementioned loss of small game hunting areas, but also the increased prevalence in trophy hunting. The concept of trophy hunting is inherently hunting large, rare, or dangerous animals and small game simply does not fit within these categories. Further, when hunters do hunt specifically for meat these days, they are typically hunting for foods similar to the kind that can be bought in the store, such as venison, rather than small game which is often considered dirty and disease-ridden. However, even today, raccoon is still eaten alongside other small game. But it seems that over the past several decades, there has been almost a strange fascination with raccoon as a food source. There are a number of raccoon food festivals in the United States, and there have been articles written about individuals who specifically hunt and eat raccoon and other small game. That being said, 
The possibility that small game hunting returns is one of uncertainty. Hunting as a whole is on a decline, and big game offers a considerably better investment for urban hunters as trips are expensive, and big game can produce considerably more meat and overall value to smaller animals. However, there are attempts to prioritize hunting for animal control. Recently, Utah voted to make hunting and fishing the primary form of animal control within the state, arguing that it causes little environmental damage when responsibly done, leads to massive government revenues for conservation efforts, and hunters see first-hand changes that occur within low-traveled areas, allowing observation of how the environment is changing in a way that otherwise would be impossible. And that's where the story leads off, with small game being considered a leisurely and niche activity among many hunters. I hope you learned something today, and if you do have any questions about anything that I've talked about, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. I've included a list of my sources in case you want to know something a little bit more. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave a like if you did, and I'll be sure to see you next time. I'm the Pop Historian.